morning, supervisors. Good morning, community. Matt Willis, Public Health Officer um, with the COVID-19 update for this week. Um, if I can have my slides, please, Alvaro. Um, I'll be reviewing the numbers um, and then get into some of the key priorities and strategies for this week. The first slide, please. So this is a slide that shows uh, to total cumulative cases in Marin County since the beginning of our experience with the pandemic that started their first case in early March. We've had a total of 4,373 cases thus far. Next slide, please. We've tested 77,602 people um, with a, a total of 147 have been hospitalized since the start with 87 total deaths among Marin County residents. Next, please. This is our epidemic curve. And when we talk about flattening the curve, this is uh, what we refer to, the total number of new cases per day. This refers to the date on which those individuals were tested. Um, and what we see here is a, you know, a classic epidemic curve that has a rise, a plateau, and a decline. Um, our goal here is to continue to flatten the curve. And I'll talk uh, in a minute about how important it is that we continue to, despite the fact that we've seen success um, over the past two months, really continue to drive that downward if we want to maintain our position in, in tier two in the state's blueprint. Next, please. This is the demographic makeup of our cases thus far. On the left, you see the distribution by age. The far left column refers is, is our um, baseline distribution countywide of people of different ages. Um, and then on the right columns, you see how those correspond to either cases, hospitalizations, or deaths from COVID-19. The most important feature here is that if you look on the far right column, the deaths, it's about 96% of our deaths in Marin County are among people aged 65 or greater, really pointing to the particular vulnerability of our elders and the, the reason why we need to be focusing our strategies in that way. Uh, there's no meaningful difference between gender in Marin County. Next, please. This is the uh, demographic makeup regarding race and ethnicity. On the far left, the donut there uh, shows our baseline proportion as a, as a, as a population. Um, and the most important feature here is that while, uh, while people who identify as Hispanic or Latino um, make up 16% of our, of our county, um, they make up 70% of cases. Um, at the peak, when we had the greatest number of cases in July, that number was actually 80% of total, total cases. So we are seeing some improvement um, in, the, in, in the epidemic as it's being experienced as one of our most marginalized community with reduced percent positivity, reduced case rates in the Canal District of Center Fell, for example, um, and a decreased proportionality or disproportionality um, between white um, and Hispanic uh, residents. Um, some have asked on the far right there, and deaths, some have asked over this past week, why are we seeing, despite the fact that our, our white residents only make up 22% of our cases, why do they make up a full 75% of deaths? And the answer is um, related to the experience of, uh, you know, as I said, 96% of our residents, 96% of our deaths are among our older residents. Um, about 90% of those deaths are, are people who live in long-term care facilities, their skilled nursing homes or residential care facilities for the elderly. And that is a demographically primarily white population in Marin County. Um, and that explains the, the reason why there's a disproportionality towards people of um, white ethnicity or race um, in, among our deaths. Next, please. This is our total hospitalizations from the start. And, and what's um, important about this is, is today, there are fewer people, and the, the last time we've had this, this few people in the hospital in Murray County was uh, on June 21st. Um, there are eight people hospitalized currently. So another really important sign of, of the progress we're making. Next, please. This um, also captures the same, the same issue in terms of hospitalization rates, but looks at hospitalization rates across all Bay Area counties per capita. And what this shows is that if you look at early July, we had the highest hospitalization rate per capita of any Bay Area county. And today we have the lowest hospitalization rate of any Bay Area county. Um, another sign of the, of the particular progress we've made in Murray. Next, please. 
So all of that allows us to be moving forward in our uh, shelter in place and, and, and our process of progressive reopening. Um, the state has, um, as you know, the governor issued the blueprint for reopening the economy of California um, with four different tiers. Every county is classified in one tier according to the burden of, of COVID-19. Um, the most restrictive tier, tier one, had been the tier that we opened in last month. We moved into tier two last week. Um, we are now um, in our second week in tier two. We have been successfully classified as being a, a tier two county again. So last week and this week we are in tier two. This, week, this is the, the numbers. Our total, as of last week, our total case, raw case positivity rate, our, our case rate was 7.1 cases per 100,000 residents on average over a week period. Um, and that adjusted based on our testing rates to a rate of six, which allowed us to move into tier two with a 3.3% 3, 3 positivity rate. And those numbers have improved. Um, later today, the governor will be announcing our new numbers, but I, but I know that those numbers, because we're tracking them on a daily basis, are steadily improving. Next, please. This is just to remind everyone what those tiers correspond to in terms of case rates and percent positivity. We are in, in tier two, the red or substantial transmission tier, down from where it's considered widespread transmission. Um, our case rates, uh, adjusted case rates, are somewhere uh, around the five range, um, and it's four to seven would be the number that corresponds to that substantial tier with a percent positivity of five to eight percent. Again, ours is beneath that. Our, our percent positivity actually corresponds to the orange tier, which is tier three. Next, please. And this is what all that means in terms of what can be opened in Marin. We are tying our, our reopening strategy to what the state allows in the blueprint. Um, and so what we see published in terms of the state allowances is what we can expect to be experiencing in Marin. Um, and so what this means for tier two, briefly, I'll just run through them, is that hair salons are open, retail malls, uh, the indoor malls, Northgate Mall can be open at 50% capacity, libraries at 50% capacity, personal care services came back online last week, which includes nail salons, tattoo, body piercing, estheticians, et cetera. Um, museums can be open indoors at 25% capacity, as well as places of worship, movie theaters, um, hotels and gyms, um, uh, and fitness centers can also be open indoors at 10% capacity. And then restaurants, importantly, indoor restaurants can open at 25% capacity. And if you look to the next tier, the, the orange tier, most of the change between tier two and tier three is just that the, the, that percent capacity, which is generally either 10% for gyms or 25% for restaurants, movie theaters, and worship, um, is expanded to a greater percent capacity. There aren't a lot of new sectors that come online so much as just that being able to expand more indoor activities as we move into the next tier. Next, please. For schools, um, there's a separate process that it relates to the tier process. We need to be in tier two for at least two weeks um, before schools can reopen to classroom-based learning without a waiver from the public health officer. Um, and that would be um, TK through 12 and higher education could reopen. The earliest that could happen would be September 29th. And we are again in our second week now in tier two. Um, we have uh, heard indication from some schools that they do plan to reopen the classroom-based learning in early October. Um, have not heard from um, any schools that have not obtained waivers that they plan to open on that day of September 29th. Currently, a waiver is required because we don't have that two weeks under our belts in Tier 2 um, for any schools to reopen. And, and historically, because we were in Tier 1, um, several schools applied to reopen under that clause um, with permission from the public health officer. And we have issued 32 waivers. Um, to, to, to obtain a waiver, they need to fill out a school site specific protection plan, indicating that they understand all the standards necessary to reopen safely, including testing strategy, screening processes, um, establishing a liaison with public health to make sure that we have someone on campus that we can reach to and have a direct conversation with if there's any issues on campus. The total schools that have obtained waiver reflate about 4,000 students, which reflects about 10% of our total student population. Next, please. So this is an important organizer, I think, for us um, just moving forward. Uh, on the right here, you see the experience um, in the United States with the pandemic influenza of 1918. 
Um, and it shows that there were, instead of, you know, when we talk about flattening the curve, it's not necessarily just one curve. There can be multiple curves, more like waves. Um, and if you look at on the left, that's been our experience with COVID-19. Um, so you see, you might call it one wave, you might call it two waves. It looks a little bit like what we saw in pandemic influenza with that small blip of wave one on the far left from March with, with, a, with, a, you know, with a shelter in place, placed mid-March, flattening of the curve. And then we began to reopen in early May and we saw increases that might correspond to that wave two. And then now we're seeing decreases. So the question for us is what future will we choose? Will we see a third wave? Will we see another wave? However you would define it, the possibility is that we would see increases, especially as we reopen. And that's our challenge is to, is to reopen now um, without seeing more increase. What I think makes me feel confident that we can is that from July, or the peak, to now, we did not see significant changes in our policies. Um, our shelter-in-place policies have not changed a lot since mid-July because we were relatively conservative in our approach. We've been cautious. Um, so that progress from mid-July to the current was based primarily on behaviors. Um, and we can't attribute it, again, to any radical change in policy or any other major change in our strategy. Yes, we've done a lot of testing. Yes, we do contact tracing and reaching cases as early as we can. We've done a lot in the, in the skilled nursing facility setting. But really the primary progress, I think, is attributable to the work that everyone has done in their everyday lives to take the steps necessary to prevent transmission. We need to do more of that in order to hold on to the gains we've achieved and not slide back and be uh, placed back into tier one. Next, please. So to that end, we need to all understand in our own personal behaviors across that continuum of risk and, and the decision we're making, we, the decision making we you know, make every day. Um, the most important factor right there on the top is wearing a face covering near others versus not. The safer choice versus the riskier choice. This is an infographic that we now have on our website and it's a way of trying to communicate kind of a new way that we're trying to um, approach this issue rather than having expecting that there are policies that prevent choice um, and dictate what we can do in our everyday lives. We're actually, you know, as we reopen, there's a greater and greater role for, for personal choice um, and navigating those decisions appropriately. So this is just a, a way of reflecting that. Obviously it's safer to wear covering, facial covering than to not wear facial covering. Physical distancing outside the home is much safer than um, getting close to strangers um, Staying home if you're ill is safer than going out even if you're sick. Um, and this is a way, again, of um, just helping us navigate those choices that we're facing every day. Next, please. I wanna call your attention to uh, the second one here, socializing with friends outdoors versus hanging out with friends indoors. That's particularly important for us in Marin. We're seeing an increasing fraction of our cases when we do contact tracing that are attributable to, to um, parties that have occurred. Uh, we know that one of the main drivers for us is essential workers who've been on the front lines all along. We live in densely, dense, dense housing, um, low income, very difficult, very challenging setting to try and address the determinants of that driver of transmission. Um, there are other, uh, other drivers of transmission that, that are emerging now that are, um, I think we have a lot more control over, and that's the decisions to either gather or not indoors, uh, participate in parties, sleepovers, that kind of thing, and again, it's frustrating from a public health standpoint when you see that now up to 15% of our cases are attributable to those sorts of choices. Um, and it's something we cannot afford to do if we wanna stay in tier two and continue to reopen. Next, please. So I just wanna to touch on this. This is one of our um, new priorities that is just emerging as we um, see the, the vaccine um, is, is potentially gonna be available um, as early as November. Uh, we don't know one of the, you know, there are several unknowns here in terms of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Um, we don't know exactly when it will arrive. We don't know the efficacy yet. There are still in phase three clinical trials, you know, 30,000 people per trial um, trying to determine its efficacy. Uh, we don't know what the initial supply will be, the number of doses that we might first get and the formulation among those formulations that are still being considered, which we would actually have first. We are also assessing the safety you know, we are fortunate um, in Marin County to be part of a, a robust academic environment with UC Berkeley, UCSF, Stanford, um, and we are 
already public, you know, public health officers in the Bay Area counties are working together to try and have a regional and cohesive standardized approach to the vaccine distribution when, when that happens and leaning into our academic partners to help us make sure that um, the vaccine has actually um, gone through the, 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 the process to determine its safety and efficacy through an independent process of, of verifying where and when those trials occur to make sure that the data is actually accurate um, and verified. Reassuringly, the, the, the trials that determine the safety of the vaccine are generally occur in academic setting um, with academic partners and not, are not happening behind closed doors um, within government. Um, and that, that I think offers a measure of assurance um, that the results are likely to be reliable um, if the results are determined with efficacy. And importantly, also, when we hear about 50% efficacy or 60% efficacy, that might sound low, but what that would mean is that um, you're half as likely to get the infection, like half as likely to get the disease. If, you, if it's a 50% effective vaccine and you're vaccinated, it reduces your chance by half of actually becoming ill. Priorities in planning for the vaccine are that we are first trying to determine um, who would be in that first tier. We expect to receive a limited supply. Um, we're hearing that we may receive as few as 10,000 doses in the first few weeks. So we are um, trying to work again on a regional basis to determine which tiers would fit into that first tier. I mean, which, which occupations would fit into that first tier, leaning primarily towards healthcare workers and first responders, people that are our critical infrastructure. Um, for the, for the response itself would be the first tier for receiving vaccine. Then the second tier would be our higher risk residents. And then the third tier, our general population. And of course, these are important decisions to navigate um, regionally and working with the CDC and California Department of Public Health to make sure that there's a fair and equitable process for the vaccine distribution. And then of course, it, some of the formulations are uh, will require significant investment in storage capacity because they are, need to be stored at very low temperatures. And that's infrastructure that's not routinely available. So that's going to also need to be an important aspect of planning. And of course, the distribution network um, so that we can get people vaccinated in a timely and fair way. Next, please. So I'll end with this flu. Um, so this is, we're coming into flu season. Um, What's good is that the things we're doing to protect ourselves against uh, COVID-19 will also protect us against flu. Masking, physical distance, hand washing, staying home when, there's, when you're sick, those sound very familiar. Those are the things we've been saying for the past few months, um, and they will also protect us against influenza. The other important aspect of protection against influenza is the vaccine, something we don't yet have for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and why this year especially should we be taking these steps? We're concerned that there would have, we could have seasonal surges of both flu and COVID-19. Um, influenza uh, every year in Marin County, especially since we have an, a, you know, an older population, um, our ICUs are sometimes full um, just with you know, seasonal influenza cases. So we really are already functioning close to capacity many years during the flu season um, and could not manage a second uh, surge with COVID-19. Um, so we can all do our part to protect our, our healthcare system by getting vaccinated. And then because on an individual level, the risk of being infected with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 virus as well as influenza virus increases the risk of severe outcomes and mortality. So as a matter of personal protection, and as a matter of civic responsibility, um, this is an important, important year to get the flu shot. Next, please. So your, your medical provider will be thrilled if you reach out um, and um, ask for, for a flu shot. Um, most are doing drive-through now. Uh, it's one of the silver linings of uh, the way we've approached uh, our, our testing with COVID-19 is that there's now robust drive-through options um, that we can, we can do flu shots as well. Kaiser is offering drive-through flu shots and other medical providers as well. Next, please. So to summarize, we're making significant progress. Our case counts, hospitalizations, and percent positive rate are the lowest they've been in three months. That's due to the sum of collective measures, of personal behaviors, people um, taking the, making more of the right choices in their everyday lives. This is something we're gonna have to do even more of. Um, we have more, more testing and more tracing happening. We are now linking our, our local strategy to the state blueprints. Um, our tier two allows new activities indoors, which is a risk. 
Obviously, the risk is higher for transmission indoors and outdoors. Um, we need to monitor this closely. Public health will be monitoring very closely if we're seeing evidence of transmission in restaurants or gyms, movie theaters, et cetera, when we do our contact investigations. We may need to make selective closures depending on what we find. Um, we, are back, we are now planning for uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And please get your flu shot. Next, please. And that summarizes my presentation. Thank you. Great, Dr. Willis, excellent report.